Let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time tonight. We thank you for those that are able to come out. Be in our conversation as we study your word. And we just look to you, Father, in all this. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. Alright, if you don't have last week's, get to this week's. But if you, remember, we didn't quite finish up last week's lesson. But you, you got it. So you got to stuff the paperwork. But I'm just going to touch on that and kind of finish that up um, tonight. So we're going to start with Genesis 35. 16 and 17. Is it the same for this one? No, that's actually the next lesson. I'm, I'm, we didn't finish last week's lesson. Yeah, that's tonight's nice lesson only. And so actually you can have this paper when I'm done with it if you want it. Okay? So it's Genesis 35, 16 and 17. And so I'll go ahead and read it. And it says, Then they journeyed from Bethel, and went, th and there was but a little distance to go to Ephrath, which is <laughs> uh, just out part of Bethlehem, the southern Bethlehem. Rachel labored in childbirth, and she had hard labor. Now it came to pass, when she was in hard labor, that the midwife said to her, Do not fear, you will have this son also. So... She's in labor. I think she's beginning to realize that I might not make it mm. in, in all of this. And, I'll, and when we get to verse 18, I'll, I'll tell you why. And so, as she's labor, there's an amazing little story in all of this that we're going to get to and when we get to what I've got planned for on um, the lesson for tonight, but it's kind of close to touching on it. Okay, there was no connection. Remember, this whole time through all of this, Rachel and Leah were battling on who could have the most kids. It was basically what was going on. A lot of distension, a lot of brokenness in that family, and so here we have it. There's no, there's none of that even mentioned. Um, Ephrath, when it talks about Ephrath, I know we, we've talked about this before. Um, when it talks about Ephratha, Bethlehem, there was two Bethlehems. One was south of Jerusalem, was close to Jerusalem, and the other one was way north, up by Nazareth, okay? Both called Bethlehem. And it's amazing when the prophets talked about it, they called out the Ephratha, pointing out it's the small, it's the Bethlehem by Jerusalem. I find that amazing. That in all the writings, that, that, and so here, even in Genesis, it calls out that same thing. Which is, and so she's in labor, she's giving birth, the midwife is there. Verse 18 says, And so it was as her soul was departing, for she died, that she called his name Benoni, Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. There's an amazing Benoni. This word in Hebrew would be this. And you would say it N O N E. Okay. That's a very common name in a lot of languages. You got Benoni in Italian, it's a, a lot of theirs, that's the last name. And they have different understandings to it. In Hebrew, this Benoni. And it talks about this in the text, is the son of my sorrow. Okay? In other places, and that's translated into Hebrew that way, depending on how you do this word here. Because some say ben, ben Oni is in Hebrew. And others pronounce it. And this word changes changes in the definition of this. This would be said the son of my sorrow would be the son, my progeny. That changes big time just between here. And saying Benoni versus Ben Oni. <laughs> it's a play of words, is really is what it is. 
And so you have, and even the Bible scholars, they talk, and they get on all of this a lot of times. They keep it just pure Hebrew. It's this one. And only, and she translated, and it would be, son of my sorrow. Okay? But there's an amazing thing. Is it just, see, I don't believe in coincidence. I just think there's, it's either God or it's not. There's, there's, there's no in between. <clears throat> but if, in Benoni, the, the son of my prodigy, has a definition that ties more to what um, Jacob named him. He says, no, I'm not going to call him Benoni. Benoni. I'm going to call him Benjamin. And so in that little story there, we're seeing this played out. Benoni means son of my sorrow. And ultimately, this shows the futility of Rachel's competition with her sister. Now at the time of her final victory, she's having the last child, number 12, okay? And all she found was sorrow. I think she's realizing, I may not survive this. And there's a reason why she doesn't survive it. We're going to get into that in a minute. And his father, his father called him Benjamin. Now, Benjamin translates son of my right hand. Now that's a powerful name to give Benjamin, son of my right hand. You see, all through the Bible, the right hand represents greater strength, honor, and power. Let's do a couple of these. We won't do, we won't do them all. But, but let's do Jack, I'll put you to work. Exodus 15, 6. Debbie, can I get you to look up Psalm 16, 8? You, want do, you do want Hebrews 1, 3. No, I think I'll be enough. We're not doing them all, but you can go, go look them up. They're all talking about this and all these things. And I want to do the Exodus 1 and the Hebrew 1. So that's a great vast of time between Exodus and Hebrew. And they're both saying the same kind of thing. Jacob names his child and calls him son of my right hand. And perhaps he sensed the special place that God would have had for Benjamin. Or it could have been that Benjamin's realizing she's not going to make it. This is my last child and this is the love of my life was Rachel. Mm -hmm. And that had some reasoning why he did that. We can't totally know that, okay? Um, but it's an amazing story. She says this Benoni and he takes that, that, those words and place it, no, it's going to be Benjamin. And so, um, Exodus uh, 15, 6. Okay. Your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed the enemy in pieces. So, the right hand has a very powerful message to that. Um, Psalm 16, 8. 16, 8. I keep the Lord in my in mind always because He is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Yeah, see, and so now this son is, and see, and I think I wonder if that has a lot to play with it. This is the last child that you know I'll ever have is have having the love of his life, Rachel, and that son's going to be there at my right hand. And that same idea mm -hmm. ties to kind of what you I had you read yeah. there, and Hebrews one three. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power mm -hmm. when he had by himself purged our sins sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now he's talking about Christ. Yeah. And he's talking about the power. And he sat down. He paid our sin debt. <clears throat> and he sits down where? At the right hand of God. Yeah. That's the place of power. Okay. And so we see that in the naming of Benjamin. And that's playing out between she's naming him the son of my sorrow because she realizes she's not going to survive. We still use that term today, you know, my right-hand man. Yeah, my, yeah. yes, we did. It's that same idea. Yeah. You know, there's a place of special person there. Yeah. And in, in, in Christ, it talks about him and he is the right hand of God the Father. He's ruling and reigning. And so we have this playing out here. And the right hand represents greater strength, honor, and power. So, tonight's lesson, Genesis 35, to the death of Rachel, is the top of it, should say. I find this amazing. You have to go too far, Jackie. I'm going to put you to work again. It's an easy one to go back to. Genesis 31, 32. Debbie, can I give you Genesis 30, verse 1? 
And let's see what else that we got here. No, let's leave it at that for right now, okay? Rachel's the diadem was buried, okay? And so as we're doing, actually I'm going to read 19 and 20, and then, then we'll talk about it. So Rachel died and was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem, there it is, okay? And Jacob set a pillar on her grave, which what is the pillar of Rachel's grave to this day. And so, as he's burying her there, in this place, it's a special place that, that, that they put her, okay? But why, she's just gave birth to the 12th son, and the 12 tribes, okay? Benjamin's now born. And it's almost like God said, okay, your job is done. You were the baby maker. And now I'm taking you out. But there's a reason why he did that. And it's amazing. We, we don't think about the power behind words to, as they did in that day. There's things that they say and it became prophetic just by the fact that they said them and God honored it. It finds it amazing that kind of stuff. And we see that here. And uh, remember when Rachel was leaving? And we had a discussion on, on the, the why, and again, we, we all, there's three or four things you can look at and say, is that the why? You can't totally know. But remember when she was leaving, she stole Laban, her father's pile. Hmm? Household item. And the household, remember that? In, the, in that story? And in that process of that, Jacob not knowing who did it, he called something out. Oh. Found in Genesis 31, 32. Sure did. I remember it yeah. chills all the way down the spine. <laughs> Go ahead and read it, Jackie. Okay. With him ever you find your gods, do not let him live. In the presence of our brethren, identify what I have of yours and take it with you. For Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them. Yeah. And so basically he was saying, May the person that stole this idol be brought to death. Now God didn't kill her, right, take her out right away. Because he had his plan for her to bring in the twelfth son. But the second that son was born, that prophetic word from Jacob. Yeah, what gives Jacob the power to kill her? Well, he didn't know it was her. I know, but, but, but that's how God just got honored. But I mean, you know what I'm saying is, uh, but <clears throat> sometimes we got to be careful what we say <laughs> <laughs> and how we say things. Yeah, <laughs> because it can come. I'll tell you a story. This is a true story. I wish Linda was here. She didn't know this story. I don't know if Mom won't. I think they were already moved away. Um, if you remember Glenn Young, who mm -hmm. was part of the Huntington Park Church, Southgate uh -huh. Church. And um, I came here, was pastoring here, and I was pastoring a little church in Surprise. And I'm not telling, I've got to be careful how I say this, because it makes you, you know. Well, anyway, Glenn Young, when we were in California, and pastor there, he was, he, he was a, an older gentleman, and he was, uh, he had pastored for years. He, he was, uh, I think he was an ordained Liberty Baptist preacher. And, um, and in fact, there was times that, you know, we get burned out, get tired, of you know, you know, he'd step in and take some of the services and give me a, 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 a weekend off, you know. Be able to get to this to be able to rest. It's, it's to do the work of a pastor and then having to carry a job too, it was a lot of work. You know, you know I was a young man, and there was times it got to be problematic. Well, long story short, when we came here over time, the church that I pastored, which was now in Southgate, California, I don't know if some of you know where that's at, it's Southeast Los Angeles, tough <laughs> neighborhoods, okay? Yeah, you know, when I say it that way, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? A little rougher. Yeah, right? a little rougher. <laughs> well, my son was born in, uh, he was born at St. Francis Hospital in Linwood. 
say, what's that guy's name? Linwood butts up to Compton. You've probably heard of that place, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was our old neighborhood, okay. So long story short, over the amount of time, the church transition is still going very strong in California, but it is now, uh, said the Baptist Church of Southgate, it is the Iglesia Baptista mm -hmm. <laughs> Church, okay? It's all Spanish, okay? So they retired and they came over here. And I don't know what triggered it. I didn't even know what was going on, totally. I had no idea until right to the end of it. But for some reason, he came over and decided, I want to take the church where Pastor Ron's pastoring. Mm -hmm. And he began to work behind the scenes and undermine things. Mm -hmm. I had no clue. <coughs> I had no clue what was happening. And there was something that was said that brought this thing to a, to a light. And so I confronted him, went to him and talked to him. He wouldn't let it go, he was lying about it. Calling me crazy. In fact, there were some of the old elders in that church that said, oh, we've never seen anything like this, Pastor Ron, and you're a young pastor, oh, you shouldn't be doing this. I said, no, 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 that's exactly what the Word of God says. I took him before the church, okay? And of course, as it was coming out, he just, he just blew up. He just blew up, became friends. Now remember, I don't even know all the details of this yet. I mean, I got a glimpse of it, that they said something. Tried to have him a conversation of it. But after it was all over, you know how things like that really happen. Then you start hearing all the details of what was real. And they, they just figured somebody told me. Well, what, somebody did tell me, but it was none of them. <laughs> yeah, and I didn't even know it in total. He said, what's all this got to do with this? Well, I'm, I'm heading there, okay? And so, he blew up. I mean, he said words in the church should never even be said out, it be said at all. I thought, whoa, he's not where he should be with the Lord. So as he stormed me out of there, I don't know why, I said to him, God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. You've sowed to the wind. You're going to reap the whirlwind. He had some choice words for me. He went out the door. Well, because of this stirring up in that community, he went over to Blythe just to get away. He had a friend over there, and him and his wife went to Blythe. And he was helping his friend pull out a stump, and the tractor fell back on him and killed him one week from that stump. One week mm -hmm. from that happening. So why does God give you the words? I don't know. Did you do the same with Jacob? Probably. Mm -hmm. And here it played out just that way. I think I terrified that little church in South Carolina. Oh, be careful, Pastor Ron, you say, and it shouldn't it wasn't like that. I had no idea. But you didn't wish him to die. No, I didn't. But I spoke those words. Right. I and then that. boom, now he's gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that's coincidental? No, God. no, I don't think, I think I don't of all. It's I don't either. Yeah. You and me both. Right. I don't believe in it either. Yeah. Just for that's what. And God gave him an opportunity to repent. He refused to do it. I had a man that yeah. yeah. busted through my door, put a gun to my head, and looking for somebody else. But I mean, he helped me at gunpoint until I found this person for him. Yeah. Oh and my gosh. When he left there, you know, I had, my kids were all there witnessing it and everything. I had to call and have them taken out by their dad. He let all this happen. He even called the police on himself and everything, but when he left, I told him somebody's going to blow your head off mm. a week later. He, he did. Was, I mean, he was he did. Off. Uh -huh. God's just, he's a uh, you know, and sometimes does he have to say things? Yeah. You know, on our up story, you know the Patrick story, I told that several times about Patrick being in the hospital and, mm. and that whole thing, and he's, um, he got kind of angry at me when I'm trying to talk about surrendering your life to Jesus Christ. Don't you know I'm dying? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'm dying. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> so then I, I just said, okay, you know, and I just said this, and I, it was the Lord. It wasn't me coming up. I, I'm not that brilliant, Tom. <laughs> and so what I said to him, let me rephrase that then. Are you willing to surrender whatever time you have left to the Lord Jesus? Well, he lost it. He did. Five years has gone by. Actually, I just talked to him the other day. He's doing really well. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, because yeah, that was like a stumbling block. And God yeah. just kind of gave him yeah, yeah. 
And so, but words matter. What you say matters. And you were take a look at that, even what Rachel said, Genesis 30, verse 1. You're on, Debbie. When Rachel saw that she was not bearing Jacob any children, she envied her sister. Give me sons, or I will die, she said to Jacob. Wow. Not only did he give, give her sons, she died giving birth to the last one. I don't see that as just accidental. Call me crazy. But that's all that way for a reason. And so, here we go. So, Jacob sits a pillar in a grave. It's all just so that even when we get right with God, and he's doing the right thing, he's got to be hurting inside. This is the love of his life. I mean, he loved Leah in his own way, but he loved Rachel. We already talked about all that. Yeah. And so, it doesn't mean that life's just going to always be easy. Sometimes when you do the right thing, it's a very hard, hard, hard price to pay. And there's times we scratch our heads and say, like, why, Lord? You know, why? But God knows what he's doing. So there's, there's constant challenges for us just to trust God. We talked a little bit last week about uh, John the Baptist. Remember? Yeah. Huh? He carried out the perfect will of God. But God said he did it perfect. Actually, he said this about John. There's been no greater prophet in all of Israel than John the Baptist. Yeah. He didn't live very long. Right. There's somewhere in the Bible, basically, when you're done with God's mission, so to speak, but he has, then yeah, he has it's to time to get down. He takes you home. He, he takes you home. Yeah. John the Baptist went out in a, in a horrible way. Didn't yeah, that's, that's, that's the point. But he, he did. He accomplished, he accomplished exactly, exactly what he was supposed to. Right. Lost his head in the process. Mm -hmm. Now, from that point of view, yeah. he's kind of like, oh, struggling a little bit, and which we all would be. Oh yeah. And uh, yeah. yeah, it doesn't always come out the way we want it to. And we have a whole story. He didn't. No. <laughs> that's right. We have a lot more information than he ever yeah, had for us, but we. Yeah. yeah, exactly right. That's exactly right. So, we cannot prize comfort more than getting right with God. Remember that whole thing that they were all they were doing was when they were all in uh, chapter 34, and that whole thing was going on. Is uh, it was more about? Remember, we I said it was more about women than wealth. Mm -hmm. Huh? That whole chapter was like that, and you can't put yourself. You know, we don't think of it that way. But sometimes God wants us to do things that are hard and takes us out onto the edge and puts us in a place that's, oh, this is not easy, Lord. This is not comfortable. And we like to be comfortable, don't we? We're spoiled. We are spoiled. We're very spoiled. But can comfort become an idol? Yes. Huh? Absolutely. Huh? I'd say it can, can it? I tell you, um, through this other Bible study, I'm doing, I think about that the other day, you know, and um, here in America, I mean, we don't have people really that go hungry, you know, not, not really. I mean, no. they, there's always some place for them to go to get food and eat, and right. you know, even our homeless people, you know, and, and, mo and many of our homeless are choosing to be homeless. Right, but, right. You know, they're by choice, not by poverty-stricken. Right. Like other countries, you know, right. somebody go They like, have wow. no choice, yeah. But I mean, usually I was just thinking about that. I'm like, that is just like crazy, you know, because here in America, we have no idea how blessed we are. Um, we are. We no. don't even have a clue. No. No, we don't. And it's like, good grief. I remember when I went in 2012, you know, I'm, I really hadn't traveled out of the country much, been to Mexico, been to Canada, and that was about this, instead of traveling outside this country for me. Went to England once. Um, uh, had, we had a couple weeks to go to England, and they had an opportunity there. There was this thing, we had our own travel agency. It was a long story, but our company had its own travel agency. And so it, they were saying, wow, that's a good deal. They're having offers from uh, going from Houston, Texas to London, England for $99 each way. I said, book them. Yeah. <laughs> book two of them. Tell me the dates and I'm going to go on vacation. Yeah. And uh, so, I've been, uh, you know, and that's more like 
here compared mm -hmm. to being somewhere else. But when I went to Nepal in 2012, mm -hmm. I got a glimpse of those differences. The third world. And I came yeah. back home thinking, oh, how it changed, it changed the way. So when I see these younger kids go, young people you know, say, we're going to go to Nepal and minister. I said, well, I pray for them, Lord, you change their thoughts and thinking mm -hmm. the way you use that to change mine. Mm -hmm. To see things in a totally different light and way. And so, because it's made so, back to our text, uh, 35 verses 21 and 22a. Now, when you when I spread a verse like that, A and B, that's because there's two thoughts there in the verse, so I'm only taking the first thought for A, and then the next verse will be 22b, be the other half of it, okay? So, let me change pages here. <coughs> So then Israel journeyed and pitched his tent beyond the tower of Eder. And it happened when Israel dwelt in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard about it. Here that's picking up again. Remember this story? We touched on it in a couple places. And now here it's come back again. It's really going to talk about this. And we're going to talk about it again when we get to uh, chapter 49. It, it's, it's brought up again. <clears throat> so, this Tower of Eder. Jackie, one more time. I don't know, I'm putting a lot on you. Micah 4.8. Okay. There's a lot here. It says, then Israel journeyed and pitched his tent. When we're talking about Israel, we're talking about Jacob, okay? Because really, God changed his name. And we always still think of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, we, and you know that the reason is why. Well, we, and it does refer to him that way, but every once in a while it calls him by the name that God changed it to him. And here it is, it's talking about Jacob. Then Israel journeyed and he pitched his tent beyond the tower of Eder. Now in Hebrew, that tower would be, would be Migdal Eder. Tower of Eder. Okay, as the King James, as the New King James as it translates it. Micah 4 8. Did you find it? Yeah, I keep going over the top of it. Yeah, oh, I got it. Yeah, okay. So, as they're, as they're pitching their tent here, here's this. This is actually when it played out that Reuben went and laid with Bilhah, which is father's concubine. She was a slut, okay? She couldn't tell me. She probably should. She probably did tell him no, but. You're the slave. I'm the master's son. I, yeah, yeah, I am. I am the master's son. Yeah, the firstborn son. And the firstborn son. Yeah, I'm sure he played that card. And so let's talk about this. But I wanted to touch this with Micah because that's how when it talks about this tower of Eder, Micah four eight says it differently. Go ahead and read it. Okay. And you, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion. To you shall it come, even the former dominion shall come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. So what that's talking about is the kingdom of Israel. There in Micah, it calls it, in Micah 4, 8, it calls it the tower of the flock. Well, that's what either means. When you translate the word, it means the flock. Okay? And so it's talking about Israel as a nation, as a whole. And so when it happened, Israel dwelt in that land. Reuben went and laid with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard about it. So, in this whole thing, you would think that this firstborn son would have been a lot more spiritual <laughs> and living instead of by the flesh be living a whole different way. But I'm the firstborn. All the blessing of all of this, what God is doing, is falling on me. Wrong. Because what he did there... Well, didn't build a... She, she bore children for Jacob also, right? Who, but, yeah. Oh, they all did, yeah. yeah so he, yeah. he had half... Siblings. He, he, well, he, he siblings by her too. And you're not supposed to do that. But what he lost, in the, what, by doing this, and we're going to see this play out in 49, what he lost was his right to be firstborn. 
Now it's gone. Yeah, it shows it's got real character. <laughs> yeah. So, so now it's, here. remember, it fell here. Mm -hmm. Hmm? That's the next in the line. Uh, I'm going to go back for a minute. Yeah. And so, as this whole thing is playing out, and we see that Dinah is raped, and she come with had a name of, was the name of the prince, but it was also the name of the nation, the city, which was a country of its own. Remember? And Simeon and Levi came up with a plan to merge, it looked like we were going to merge these two groups together. Remember? Mm -hmm. Said, we'll let, you, we'll let her marry with you if you guys get circumcised. God never told them to ever speak anything like that. That was a covenant between him and his covenant people through Abraham's family. Not to say to outsiders, if you get circumcised, now you can be a part of it too. That's what they were saying. But they had an evil plan that we touched on in 34. He says, we're going to get them, all of them are going to get circumcised, and they agreed to it, remember? Because, hey, we're now marrying into this very wealthy family. And, and then, yeah, they, they were down, well, that was, they didn't have the medicines or the numbing agents like they even have today. That's pretty crude what they did. Those guys were all down, and then Simeon and Levi went in and killed them all. Took every last one of them out. And what we're going to get to, or we'll see later, and it touches on it. We touched on it in, in 34. We'll touch on it again in 49. But because of this sin and evil that they did, Simeon was next in line. Levi was next in line. And remember, in Simeon's case, it was a curse. Okay, we talked about this a couple, a couple lessons ago. Simeon's was a curse. You were going to be folded into the tribe of Judah. Okay, you won't exist. You won't have your own piece of land like all the other tribes. You're going to literally disappear. Okay. Levi and his descendants, because of the faithfulness, remember at Moses when they were all worshiping the golden calf? And they basically they, they said, who's on God's side? And the children of Levi, and this was out here still, they came and said, us. And so God blessed them for being faithful. So they were these were cursed. And these and Levi was blessed, and so God, in that blessing, did the very thing he said, that because of the sin you did back there, you will not have land of your own, but because of what you did in, 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 not, in coming over and not doing the gold, and worshiping that golden calf and all, all that goes with that, I'm going to let you be the, the tribe that's over the house of God, the temple. And they were now in that position, okay? And so, so they were part of the Levitical priesthood. And they couldn't own land, okay? But the, the reason they can't own land is just because God blessed them and said, I don't want you to own land, I want you because you are the priests, and they're going to, everyone's going to take care of you. But it ties back to all of this, too. So, one, two, and three get knocked out along the way. And look who becomes the firstborn son, all that goes with that, in the tribe of Judah, that brings forth Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, takes away the sins of the world. And they, they weren't perfect either, we're going to get into some of that way, but, it, but isn't it amazing how this all played out? And this is the tribe, that's Leah's son. Not Rachel's. I was going to just ask that. Yeah, it's not Rachel's, it's Leah. Judah was the first son where they actually thanked God for it. And that is, uh, thank you, thank you. 
you remember that? And we named all the sons, and they were in the battle, and naming them the names because of the battle they're in. Leah was the only son that she named him. The name Judah means praise to God. Out of all the sinfulness and the wickedness and the fleshliness going on in the naming of all the rest of them, Judah is the only one that had a name that was giving honor to God. And it all played out over time that that became the avenue where Messiah would come through. Well, they have so much foresight in names, or do the names there's influence either, the person? Or or the I mean, we pick, try to pick kids, our kids. <laughs> Some people, I'm like, really? But, um, I mean, their names are like prophetic. How do they? Yes. I can't it's answer. It's a God thing yeah. back then. It is a God. I think it's a God. It can be a God thing now. It's yeah. yeah. Psalm or Proverb. I think something one of them says something about that. That you know, he actually, you know, the names even that we have. Yeah. Well, let's we'll say it this way. I think the influence. You know, I mean, look at the song "Boy Called Sue" or whatever. It's kind of funny, yeah. but it's you yeah. name the kid or whatever. And but it even affects us too. Yeah. In the Book of Revelations, mm -hmm. and it talks about God's children. And there's names will be changed and given a new name that no man knows. Oh, okay. Every one of us are getting new names. All right. Now there's an old hymn, all might remember it. Because um, most of the songs that they sing over these guys know, it's not the ones we all know. But the song that I remember, and Linda would be sitting here saying, yes. That very probably. Yeah, the little songs. But that the song that was I'm thinking about was there's a new name written down yeah, in glory yeah. and it's mine. <laughs> oh yes, it's mine. <laughs> With my sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven. Uh, there's, we we right. sing about this stuff. Well, some of us do. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else ever heard of that song? Yeah. No, no. no. <laughs> That's That's very true. True. Yeah. I'm sure. sure. <laughs> But yeah. it's this, this story is still playing out. Yeah, but that just it amazes me. It is amazing. Oh, and I can't totally answer you because it's that amazing. It just it is just like wow, that what God does and how control he is, he's in control of all of this. So as these guys were really in touch with God at some of these times where they came up with his name. Yeah. But Have you ever looked at the meaning of your name? Yeah, but it's, it's, it's interesting. Name? You know, I can't recall right now. Yeah. They, they have several is, meanings. Mine but is the seeking one. The seeking yeah. one. That's yeah. very good. Yeah. I think Ronald is kingly. Yeah, they all like. They all have things like that. They all yeah. have good and bad in them. They oh yeah, some of them like are. Yeah, they're yeah. not so good. Yeah. yeah. But so. What's that? A farmer or an earth worker? Uh, earth worker. Means. I mean, get your hands in that dirt. Uh -huh. Even though I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> you're in the corner, maybe you're going to find some gold. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, Oil. we look at their conduct, but you don't have to think very far when you look at that family and how messed up they were. But then, you know, there's good, this, this, there's a good part of this. And I, and I put, as we talk about this, The contact was sinful, they were full of strife, there was contention, there was competition, the pursuit of the flesh. Does it surprise you that Reuben does this thing? No. And then right after that, that's how the story it just stops right there. So all it says about it here, and again it picks up in 49. We're gonna get there yet in the future before we get it, before we get out of Genesis. We're gonna get into a little more. And now it names the twelve sons. The sons of Jacob were twelve. The sons of Leah were Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Simeon, <clears throat> Levi, Judah, Issachar. Remember when we talked about Issachar? Huh? Mm -hmm. They were almost like a prophetic tribe. Mm -hmm. And Zebulun. The sons of Rachel were only two, Joseph and Benjamin. Now, I'm going to go off a little tangent for just a moment, okay? Bear with me. These guys are disenfranchised. Okay. They have no land, they're not a part of it. But we're going to get into the story of Joseph. 
in the future, I'll just kind of get you something to think about. Remember, he ends up getting sold into slavery, mm -hmm. and ends up down in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And when it comes back, when they count to 12 tribes, two of his sons <coughs> pick up the slack. Huh? We're going to pick that up, okay? It's just something I want you to think about, too. We're not going to do that tonight, but we're just going to think about that. How God's moving and working this whole thing. One of them is it's a church. Wow. It means church. Church. Wow. But so it has but it has several different ones. That's mm -hmm. the one that So verse twenty five. So the sons of Bilhah, Rachel's maidservant, were Dan and Naphtali. And the sons of Zilpah, Leah's maidservant, were Gad and Asher. These were the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Padan Aram. Remember that was part of Syria? And that's where the, the language of that day, even Jesus spoke Aramaic, comes from the, the people of Iran, which we know today as Syria. So, you've got these, these were the sons of Jacob, Nain and them. A dysfunctional family. But God's using them, not because they were great spiritual men, not because any one of them deserved it, but by he called them by grace, he chose them, and he brought them to this place. That's a hallelujah moment for every last one of us, isn't it? Yeah, because God is faithful. Huh? Yeah, he is. He's faithful. Yeah, he is. And so, Genesis 35, 27. Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre and Kerjas, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had dwelt. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years. That's pretty old, isn't it? Yeah. So Isaac breathed his last and died, and was gathered to his people, being old and full of days, and his sons Esau and Jacob buried him. His family has been in a major feud. Doesn't say there's any contention, doesn't say there's any division. That death brought that together mm -hmm. for the moment. So, for chapter 36, we're not going to get very far. And so, as we talk about this, it says, Jacob came to his father Isaac. Remember, when he went down to get his wife, he never expected to ever see his father again. He thought he was, he was going to die. Remember, he was already blind. He was blind for a lot of years. Remember the whole thing about the fur and he did that whole thing? He couldn't see. A lot of years, 20 years has gone by. And God allows him to spend some time with his father. And he got to be there before he died. See, it doesn't always play out the way we think it does, does it? Sometimes it goes the good way, and sometimes it just goes completely against what we think should happen. That's usually when our lives fall apart. Because then we <laughs> hit the realization, I've spent my entire life doing a certain thing a certain way, thinking for a certain outcome. And God was never God's plan. Never, never. <laughs> That's a rude awakening, folks. No, uh, that's a rude awakening. So, we should remember our times are in God's hands. We may expect a long or short life, but only God truly really knows. Hmm? He is the only one that truly really knows that. So, Genesis 35, 28, and 29. We're going to finish this out and we're going to stop here. We're going to use, so hold on to these papers next week because we'll pick back up here okay. right on 36. And the part of, we're going to go further. I'll, I'll keep adding to this because there's so much here. And if you were at the, if just read this chapter 36, you'd say, oh my gosh. This is as bad as the, the, the chapters of so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so. It's this whole chapter, what it's given you in that whole chapter is the lineage of Esau. And it's an amazing, there's a lot there. Your first reaction is like, oh my God. 
gosh, this thing's going on forever. And yet you can't even say their names exactly right. There's a lot of work in figuring this thing out, okay? And so, Jacob and Esau bury their father together. And then we're going to start, that's where it ends, and we're going to pick up in Genesis 36, 1 through 5. And it's amazing, some things that's going to play out here that we're going to talk about. And then we'll get to look that there's more to this story than meets the eye, okay? And so we'll leave it at that, okay? Hope you got something out of that. Any closing thoughts? Any comments? Okay, well, it's just about time. Let's close with the word of prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time. We thank you, Lord, that you so loved us, that you sent your Son to become sin for us, that we could become the righteousness of God in him. And so, Father, we just thank you, Father, for that you so loved us. And Lord, may we see as we look into this that these stories of things that really happened, how they play out, and they're examples to us yeah. to learn from. So, Father, we thank you for this class. We thank you for this time. Give traveling mercies home until we meet again. We commit it all into your hands, with, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Before you